Welcome everyone to the colloquia presentations. Oh. We're gonna start now. Please take a seat if you're still coming in. So we talk a lot about the three C's and sometimes at reunion we focus on co-op and community, but we also have classroom, if you can believe it. And uh, we have students who work very hard in the classroom during the year. And sometimes uh, we, it's difficult for alumni to have a feel of what they're doing and what their academics uh, feel like. And, uh, and th so this year we wanted you to have a taste of some uh, recent grads. All of these students have just graduated this just two weeks ago. And uh, one of the strong uh, feats of our academic program since the reopening is that all grad senior students get to present their senior project in something we call colloquia. Uh, Jennifer Wanker, who is the curator of the Herndon Gallery, can you stand up, Jennifer? She's been, she's been instrumental in organizing the colloquia, in, which are open to the public, in which you're invited to every year. And there are some colloquia catalogs that uh, are, pu are published and edited by Jennifer with all of the student uh, project, the senior students' final projects, and you can grab them on one of the tables up. And if we run out, Jennifer has more in the Herndon. Uh, we're gonna start with some introductions, and then each student are going, is going to give you a small. Um, a small window into their senior project. So, but first, please tell us your name, why you came to Antioch, what your degree was in, what your senior project is about, and maybe your favorite co-ops. What about now? Okay, I see the green light. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, if I can remember that list, uh, my name is Noah Yasger. Um, my major, I self-designed, it's called Communal Studies. And I did four and a half co-ops, it's complicated. But um, a lot of them were very community organizing oriented or intentional community oriented, which kind of became the subject of my senior project. Um, why I came to Antioch, uh, I went to Ohio State before, and my parents would say I transferred from there, but I definitely dropped out and decided to go to college two years later. And I needed something weirder. I needed them to let me, I needed to, you know, I wanted to have the onus on me to uh, create my education and all those buzzwords. Um, and a lot of them were true. Um, but I did a co-op, added, Jewish Urban Garden. I did a co-op, um, which became my senior project, which was an OLA project, which is oral history, liberal arts. So the oral history project involved interviews on creating a podcast as a final project, which is too long to present, so I'm gonna present about my senior project. And um, did a co-op at some place called the Solar Living Institute, which was the first place in America, at least to sell a residential solar panel. And there's still like a one-stop shop for sufficient or self-sufficient living. And I did a co-op on a farm in Ohio called That Guy's Family Farm um, at Farmer's Market, maybe near you if you're in Cincinnati. Um, but they were lovely. They were some of my favorite parts of Antioch was the parts when I wasn't at Antioch. Um, and, I, and I came for co-op and I also came for what we've called recently as curricular assets, the Glen Helen, the Antioch Farm, the amount of green space, the town of Yellow Springs, which my parents assured me was cool. Um, but yeah, that's nice. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. It uh, worked out well. Um, yeah, that's my piece. Yeah, I'm a off the handle kind of person, not doing that. Um, so hi, I'm sure you guys met me. My name is Lanique Dawson, um, 2019, like the rest of us. Um, who am I? Who's Lanique Dawson? So I'm a New Yorker. How to get to Antioch? 
15 hours away, right? <laughs> um, a letter in a bottle got me. Um, so I'm a LEAF uh, fellow, a leader of environmental science at Antioch College fellow, right? Um, the entire aspect was, do you want to be an environmental scientist? Do you want to work in sustainability? Um, can you bring that to our campus? Um, and I hope that I did. I hope that I can look back and be like, oh yeah, we worked on a few things. I had an opportunity to work with Kim Landsberg on her EPA grant as a LEAF fellow. Um, had the ability, the great ability to work um, alongside the Glen Helen and my various co-ops. Um, Fantastic. So um, they got me with the whole environmental science uh, concepts of growing up on the Hudson. Um, I always wanted to be in water. I always wanted to uh, look at it, touch it, feel it, you know, tell you that it's good to drink, tell you that it's not. Maybe you shouldn't be jumping inside the, you know, the Glen. Eh. <laughs> but, you know, um, environmental scientists, and I say that with much uh, joy, because um, Antioch College had definitely given me the opportunity to discover what that really means. And so what that looks like in co-op wise, um, I had an amazing opportunity in Boston to work alongside with children. Wow, children are great. Um, <laughs> I had an opportunity to work with children um, and uh, provide a 12-week curriculum as we have 12 weeks here, or used to have 12 weeks here, um, and be able to design such a curriculum that focuses on environmental sustainability, uh, ranging from habitat to uh, tree identification to fish identification, which was really bizarre, especially because we were on the, on the Boston um, Bay, in the Boston Bay. Um, ranging from there to also working with um, Oregon State University and working inside their Earth uh, Atmospheric and Oceanic uh, Laboratory, working alongside what <coughs> we're presenting today. Well, not, there's no correlation, but just like the interest is, um, is a correlation of looking at phytoplankton, looking at plankton um, alike. Um, and also just really getting my start into uh, analy analytical um, research, which is where I'm trying to go next. Um, but being a LEAF fellow, getting here, going next, um, I gotta say thanks to Antioch, because without that letter in the bottle, I really wouldn't be here. Um, hi, my name is Katie Sherman. Um, my degree was a self-designed degree. It's a Bachelor's of Science, and it was entitled The Environment in the Anthropocene. So I also was mainly in interested in environmental science. Um, and that was, the majority of my course load was environmental science courses. But I also tried to take some humanity courses to kind of contextualize why we study the environment the way we do. And especially, like, look at what shape the environment is because of anthropogenic causes. Um, while I was here, I did kind of, I would say, two different variety of co-ops. I did a bunch of co-ops in outdoor education, and I also did some land restoration co-ops. Um, so as far as outdoor education goes, I was a whitewater rafting guide, a ski instructor, and then I also served on campus here as the outdoor club leader. Um, I was fortunate in Antioch's, you know, broad curriculum that they gave me time just to work on building an outdoor community here. So sourcing gear, planning trips, um, just like kind of getting people outside on campus. Um, during that time, I also worked at a lifeguard, as a lifeguard at the Antioch College Wellness Center pool. Um, and then the other co-op I had that was in land restoration was with um, Practical Ecology, which is a company in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and they do land restoration there, so removal of invasives, planting of in, uh, indigenous plants, and just kind of like land management, making sure the ecosystem is healthy. They also do consulting for businesses looking to develop land to make sure that it's done in like a, an environmental friendly and sustainable way. Um, and kind of they just advise businesses or families even in Australia um, because there's actually very strict development laws there about the best way to develop land and if they should or shouldn't. Um, but that's a bit about me and my co-ops. Oh. Um, I have to say that I chose Antioch probably for two reasons. One being the small size. It just felt like everything was so accessible. Like I can go and talk to the dean of students or like anyone just because you get to know everyone and you know also like you get to know all this, your peers too which is pretty great. And the second reason was definitely the co-ops. Um, I was really excited about having work experience before graduating. Yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thank you. So Lenique is going to start us off with our, her senior project from the lectern. While she gets ready, I'll tell you that uh, all of these students' email addresses are on the board in case you want to 
reach out to them afterwards uh, with questions or in case you want to offer them a job maybe. <laughs> and after Lenny's presentation, we'll open the floor to questions about her senior project. Uh, while we wait, Delaney from class of 2022 is going to tell us about uh, how her parents met at Antioch. Oh. <laughs> um, so my parents met to Antioch. My mom came in fresh off of... Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Delaney. I've been around. I've been registering a lot of you. Um, surprising fact, my parents met and married here. My mom came in fresh out of high school from El Paso, Texas. My dad was a transfer from like three other colleges. Uh, he came in as an arts major, left as a social worker, and my mom was an education major. Um, they met each other in sign class. So they were really cute together. Um, <laughs> so my mom's name is Elizabeth, and then my dad's name is Justin, and they decided to combine their last names in a very Antiochian way. So their last name is Schlesinger Devlin, which is also my last name. Um, and they got married actually in town the morning of the Strawberry Festival. Late 90s. 96 and 97, or 98. One of those. They graduated different years. Um, so when I arrived, my parents were with me because they are my lovely parents. And they went upstairs, and my mom shockingly said, oh wait, this is my room. And I said, oh no, what year? And she said, the year that I was dating your dad. So my parents lived in my room that I got my first year. Um, my dad then told me the story of when there were um, fire escapes outside of North and he would come in that way to go see my mom. So I know a lot about their love story, which is... Yes, more than I'm wanting to know sometimes. <laughs> Lenny, are you okay? Hi, yeah, so my name is Lene Dawson, as I said before, um, an environmental science major. Um, the objective of my presentation was to look, well, what's the title, right? It's a bunch of long names, a bunch of big words, um, but you have phytoplankton. Um, I'm not sure what anybody's perspective or like um, thoughts are on phytoplankton, <laughs> but <laughs> if you live in Ohio, if you live on the coast, if you live Anywhere where there's near water, or even if there isn't, like Colorado, where you can't collect rainwater, for example, um, if in that bucket you decide to say, screw the government, I'm just gonna collect my own rainwater, and you may find this like biofilm or like, this green sludge inside your, your bucket, that's plankton. You know, you have these small marine produce that you can find, that you can find anywhere. I'm talking about oceanic, oceanic, you can find it along the coast, you can find it anywhere. Um, more nutrients, more bio, um, more bio development. Um, and so like my senior project's title is the ecological relationship between uh, phototrophs and uh, ah, phagotrophs, um, as mixotrophs in the Chesapeake Bay. Now it's a pretty long title and I wish that this would open up. But that's just being silly. Um, and so the process I really want to walk around and do this, you guys. It's okay. Monique, you want to help I do need some assistance. I really do. Um, but I'm not going to be concerned about that. So, again, what's my presentation on? It's on phytoplankton. 
the, again, in the bucket, again, you can find it anywhere. And why is it a big problem? Well, my first slide will show you that in just our neighbor upstairs um, in Lake Erie, a repeat offender will find cyanobacteria. And in that fact, they can cause liver damage. They can harm all the, um, the what is it called? Awesome. All the various uh, algal, um, excuse me, all the various aquatic organisms within the, within the system as well. Um, but the line of thought or the line of process that is with my, presenta my presentation is identifying what are harmful algal blooms, identifying what are plankton, um, then identifying why, are they, why do they do so well in marine habitats or why do they do so well in destroying the ecosystem or being in a disturbance. Um, and then lastly, how can we actually identify that? So starting off again, that bucket, um, now let's take it to a large scale, Lake Erie. Um, everybody who lives on the coast of Lake Erie then has to deal with the whole opportunity of having liver, uh, liver defects, liver damages, because of a small bacterium, or a small protus, rather, um, that you can find within this water system. So they're bad and they're good at the same time, because like, what's, let's just say that, yay, that's awesome. So yeah, I, it's a beautiful picture that I have up there, but it's, but it's actually quite dangerous for yourself, me, um, the fish that we're catching and throwing back inside the water, if you're doing that, um, as well as just the organisms that's around, that's around um, nearby. So why am I studying this? Well, you know how everybody keeps talking about climate change and how global warming had existed at one point and there's all this uh, carbon that's being thrown into the atmosphere as well as being um, rain back into the ocean, well, they picked that up. They're actually so good at it um, that you have about 60% of uh, a particular group called diatoms. Um, what they do is that they have the ability to fixate on that carbon and take up the carbon that has then gone into the ocean. Um, wow, what a benefit for, um, for the atmosphere, but not for humans. Because what they then do is that they overpopulate. They uh, get larger than this room, rather. And as we see in the Gulf of Mexico, as we've seen um, along the sides of France, as well as even New York, Chesapeake Bay even, which is where I'm really going to, they kill fish. They pretty much harm humans. They, well, not pretty much. They're considered as harmful algal blooms for a reason, because they're harmful. Um, and so with this, like, it's a beautiful picture of this blue and green and reds and, you know, or rather blues and greens, but that's what they're identified as, only blues and greens. We don't really know what they are. We just know that there are these small flies in the walls, these small things on the ground, and we really don't really know what they are. Um, there isn't much research that pertains to this. Why? Because they're smaller than my fingers here. So we have, um, they're normally considered as uh, either blue or green or red tides. They're considered as these colors are not actually what they are. Um, and so like a place that I wanted to take or take consideration in is the Chesapeake Bay. Why? Because that's a location that actually has all these different forms of factors that will help uh, these, <coughs> these plankton in order to, um, to develop or to uh, proliferate. So with that being said, what makes them proliferate the, the best? Is it sunshine? Is it... Uh, a ton of ag, like nitrogen and um, nitrogen, as well as uh, I'm gapping on the word carbon and phosphorus. such. Yeah, phosphorus. Thank you guys. Um, but like, is it all these different? Is it all these different ag ag features, um, or is it tidal uh, mobility? You know. And so like, I've done all the research. I've done all like the looking about and like what really causes it. And in fact, it's all of them combined. So you have, this, uh, you have this location, Chesapeake Bay, you got five states, not one, two, three, four, or five, like the fifth class here just graduated and whatnot, but actually five. You have five states that contribute to this, uh, this one body of, of water, this watershed that helps 18 million people. Well, that's a lot of people, um, and there's a lot of plankton out there. And so that is, it's good because we're able to determine the quality of the water. It's great because we can say that, oh, there's too much ag in this area, there's too much carbon in the following, look at our marshes, look at etc. But they're still harmful and we're not looking into why are they so adaptive. So we saw the fact that, yeah, they can do well in this environment. We even seen aspects where they die, create this thing called uh, hypoxia, um, and that can even flow down the river as they're um, removing all the oxygen from that environment. So it's a little weird out there with um, these phytoplankton as well as these um, plankton out here. So 
some ways how people have been trying to analyze the various, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The amount of plankton that's, um, that's in the world. They've been using satellite imagery. Uh, and what that does is that, so you have a uh, phytoplankton. I've, I've been going back between phytoplankton and, and plankton. Um, and the difference is that one can photosynthesize and one can't. Um, but the real word that I should be going for is phytoplankton and zooplankton. Phytoplanktons are the ones that does photosynthesis. You have a green uh, flower out, you have a flower outside, and what's it doing um, when the sun comes up? It photosynthesizes. It provides this green um, pigmentation called chlorophyll C, or excuse me, chlorophyll A. Um, and satellites can pick that up. You can see it all over the coast, all over the, um, the gulfs. So you can see it here. They're obvious, you know, they contribute. They, again, 60% of fixation. And that's a really large number in comparison to just two. Um, so, but how do we determine how much chlorophyll either organism has? Like how well does it fixate? Which is like the question, how well do, are they doing in terms of um, getting rid of all the carbon, getting rid of, um, or rather removing all the carbon from the atmosphere? Well, some can actually photosynthesize, some can't. This, at least that's what some people thought. In other words, some organisms can eat veggies, and other ones can eat hamburgers. Um, and I understand that's a lot different than what I was talking about earlier, but you have some who they thought were phagotrophs, in other words, people who are eating hamburgers, and you have other people who are um, doing photosynthesis, in other words, phototrophs. Um, and there's this clear line in between the two, and that's not ideal. Um, all those green spots you guys saw beforehand, that's not ideal, and I'll elaborate in a moment. What people are finding now is that, um, with additional analyti uh, analytical uh, methodology, they're finding now that they don't only photosynthesize, those who were considered in the past to do so. Um, in fact, if you are exposed, if I, I'm just gonna nudge you real quick, okay, is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah? Oh, and she responded. Oops, she just responded like so. Um, and now she's winking at me just a little bit. But <laughs> would anybody else do that, you know? It's a behavioral thing. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a little history, but like it's behavioral, you know? Um, I'm not gonna go up to each person, nudge them, and they wanna sm uh, smile or wink. Um, and that's the same situation with these guys. If I put a hamburger in front of you, are you going to pick it up or are you going to throw it away? If I um, expose you to more uh, luminosity, is it going to, are you going to pick it up or are you going to throw it away? Um, and that's really my big question here. Are you going to pick it up or are you going to throw it away? Are you going to photosynthesize or not? Um, and if I expose you to that behavioral condition, will you do so? And what people are finding now is that, yeah, they will. But if I tickle your shoulder, you're going to, you're going to wink at me, you know? So. Wow, this is the, my favorite slide. So this is actually where it says, you're right, Monique, you, you've been doing the good work. So, <laughs> so yeah, so this is, the, this is my favorite slide. I know there's a bunch of little bulbs and eh, but don't worry about that. So this really solidifies the idea that are they, on the, like, are they omnivores? Like, are they doing the good deed? Are they doing both? Um, so you can see here the question of nutrients. Uh, you have carbonate, bio, you have uh, bicarbonate and you have uh, ammonium. And so that's asking the question, well, does, does nutrients affect their behavior? Um, yeah, yeah. You can see here where the, um, you have more nitrogen. Of course, if I give you more nitrogen, you get more nitrogen. You're going to have it inside your body. Or if I provide uh, smaller organisms to your meal, or perhaps if I give you hamburgers, let's go with that analogy, um, then in the second panel, you'll see that there's a lot more bio uh, development. Wow, that's interesting, because before it was assumed that if you only ate vegetation or if you only ate salads, then you were gonna continually eat salads. But to be very frank here, it's the same organism, y'all. This is the same organism. It's a photosynthetic microbe, which is so ironic to see that it's consuming hamburgers or it's consuming another uh, bacterium. No one has ever considered this in the past that you have phytoplankton or a rabbit, let's put it like that, you have a rabbit eating lions out here. You know, like, what is this? Um, and so this really like made me flabbergasted. It's like, okay, how can we actually analyze this? How can we actually de determine that this is factual? And so what people are doing now, they're using, oh, that's cool. Cause you don't really need the slides, I'm, I'm here. So, <laughs> so now you have this like spectacular, spectacular, spectacular um, materials that are coming out and you have flow cytometry and you have uh, Wow, stable isotope uh, testing. And golly gee, you have one that analyzes how many cells are in each sample. As you guys just saw with the first image, it was beautiful blues and greens and yada, yada, yadas, right? But 
how many cells are actually in that, uh, in that group. If it's not a monobloom, if it's not one thing that, you know, whatever, you'll find it, yeah, then you can't actually determine how many is inside it. You can't actually determine how many is inside the culture. So if you have all these people within the room, I can't count how many people are in the room without this device, and that's the CM, excuse me, full cytometry um, meter. That determines how many cells are still living, how many cells are actually there, how many cells are juvenile or not. Then you have stable isotope. Wow, stable isotope probing. Now let me tell you what that does, you guys. Stable isotope probing is like, this row gets nitrogen, that row gets carbon. Let's determine how well it does until it gets from this part of the food chain to that part of the food chain. And by this point, by the time I've gone over here, in the past, microscope testing has said, nah, it didn't actually work. But now we have stable isotope testing. Now we actually have this device that determines how well from that side of the room to this side of the room had it actually gone through the food chain. Um, and then that can bring up really big problems or really um, sophisticated problems towards industries that are dumping and dumping and dumping all these various ag materials into the water, all these various um, materials that are going to the water. And as um, people have seen in the past, they would, or there are some of my research people have seen that they would blame Pennsylvania. Uh, they would blame uh, New York State, for example, for some of the ag uh, inconsistencies with their policies in comparison to uh, Virginia or in comparison to Maryland. And so now you have this uh, animosity that's going around the state just because the water source isn't, isn't ideal, because you have various forms of organisms that are dying off, because you have the individuals who are living within this space who can't work in the area because they're liver, they having liver problems. You know, so that's my senior project and like, phew, how flabbergasted I really was to come out and actually do this, um, to do this literature review. Um, I hope that was extremely informative. Um, that was just like, really blew my mind, you know? Thank you, Lenique. We do have time for one or two questions about Lenique's project specifically, and uh, Delaney will bring the mic to you. Please make your comments brief so that Katie and Noah have time to present their project. the concern about environment today, what would you say is the most optimistic feeling you have after delving into this? Yeah, right? Um, <laughs> I said, given all we hear about the environment today, I was wondering after she delved so deeply into this one problem, what is her mo most optimistic statement she, she could say about it? There are so many foundations that are out there. So a course that I had taken before doing my senior project in, in totality was um, looking at conservation, looking at different um, models that they have in order to conserve these places. And estuaries are one beautiful thing because they have so many people that are, are constantly living, that are constantly living on it. And so there are so many people who care. Um, and that's in part to something that I want to do after Antioch is like talking to people and encouraging people to care because that's something that really isn't recognized when it comes to the analytics or isn't recognized when it comes to the higher you know, forms of education that there's this gap normally. Um, and to, for, so ironically was it so to see that they had so many foundations for the Chesapeake Bay, for the San Francisco Bay, um, and they're all like in partnership with it starting back in the 1970s and in the 1980s. Um, and how just like terrific it is that they encourage people from non-higher ed but from off like going to the beach, frankly, um, to take, um, to have the, also the option to participate in such like um, water cleanup or to participate in such like uh, citizen science opportunities. So like that was really a big one for me because sometimes I feel like this opportunity or like to be informed about this is so limited. But in all reality, there are so many facets in order to encourage uh, the common person to engage in such activities. Yeah. Uh, this is a related question, but um uh, on a larger scale than just individuals trying to uh, be a little more um, careful with what they're dumping into the um, water. Is there anything else that can be done to uh, control this obvious uh, problematic um, uh, growth? It's, it's primarily due to waste products that get into the water. Mm -hmm. and, um. uh, and the, so obviously you have to uh, get people but also companies to, um, to um, and this requires some political action, it requires some other um, types of uh, pressure on these companies to 
clean up their act. Um, is that uh, something that people are working on, or is it just uh, trying to tell individuals to be more responsible? I think, uh, I wonder if the question is being raised properly to deal with. Um, so this is a question that really dates back even to the, um, to the Pepsi bottle can, I mean Pepsi bottle. Um, so I'm not sure, sure if you guys are familiar um, with the whole like, oh, I'll, you can buy my product. It comes in a bottle, um, and I'll take your, I'll take the bottle and then clean it for you. Well, people stop. Well, Pepsi stopped doing that and considered it as general public as litter bugs, right? Um, giving the responsibility to the local, to the local citizen. Um, for your answer, um, are there more things to be done? Yes, because it, it's, uh, apparently in this case, um, it was the same action where people are now realizing that. No, Pepsi, you actually, at one point, washed the bottles and now you've decided to make something completely different, a can that now I have to recycle. Um, and so there are various programs as well as um, an increase in pressure uh, with this new elect, like with our current president. But, you know, like really um, like creating like uh, a clout with various um, institutions to say that no, this is actually what we want. And so I'm, in, I'm looking at the, the bottom up instead of the top, top down because it can get a lot easier when you have individuals. Um, that's one of the best things about coming to Antioch, is, reali is realizing that there are um, such clout with, with just like two people, uh, especially those who are studying environmental science or those who are being more informed. Thank you, Lenique. We're gonna move to Katie now. Thank you so much. Next time somebody tells you Antioch is not a science school, tell them about Lenique, right? If you have more questions for Lenique, her, uh, her email is on the board and you can talk to her after or throughout re reunion. Hi. Um, so the first few slides I have are just my introduction because I didn't know we were going to do it over there. But my name's Katie. Um, I majored in environmental science more or less. Um, and I <laughs> and <laughs> I'm looking to be an environmental educator or go into land restoration after I graduate. Um, so here are my outdoor education co-ops. Um, the RTA project, I didn't really talk about that before. It's really interesting. You might have seen it in the New York Times recently. It's kind of an experiential, experimental education thing following Nunnian principles, if any of you are familiar. Is that um, where the Arthur Morgan School is in Seattle? Yeah, they actually use the Arthur Morgan School campus because um, it's a summer program, so the middle school isn't there at the time. Um, and then land restoration co-ops. Um, if anybody knows Lincoln Kern, he's actually the one who started Practical Ecology. Um, he's quite a character <laughs> in the best way possible. Um, so going into my senior project, I did an outdoor backpacking trip for incoming students pre-orientation. So what was it? It was a pre-orientation trip and it lasted five days. I had quite a few people who had never backpacked before, so we took one day on campus just to kind of go over gear, pack everything, get to know each other, all of that, and then we spent four days backpacking. Where, or who, <laughs> sorry. Um, I ended up taking seven of the incoming class with us, as well as uh, two other upper class leaders, three counting myself, one faculty member, Luisa Bieri, and she brought her son, Tomei, around, along as well. Um, you can see Tomei up there. He's the shortest one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, went to, we ended up going to the Lake Vesuvius area of the Wayne National Forest near Pedro, Ohio. It's about two and a half, three hours south of here. I wanted to pick somewhere near to Antioch's campus and also somewhere rich with the history of Ohio, just to kind of give students an idea of like the I don't know, like what environment they're stepping into. Because a lot of people come from all over the country. Um, but specifically at Lake Vesuvius, they had like iron smelting ovens and other things that you'll see a picture of soon. Um, so why do this? Um, well, outdoor orientations kind of give students a, like a, a really good way to get to know each other kind of very intimately and helps them to build like social support structures and then easier, more easily transition to college. So that increased like social comfort can lead to uh, increased academic success and also like an increase in retention. And it kind of benefits both the students and the college. Um, the secondary reason that I wanted to do this was to increase like uh, sustainability culture on campus. 
Um, and the way I went about that was like building a curriculum based on Leave No Trace ethics. So Leave No Trace has seven principles um, to guide kind of how you interact with the wilderness area when you're there. And that also kind of gives people a better idea of like being able to see their impact on the environment. Also like backpacking, I mean you carry your trash for four days, like you notice like what you're doing and how that affects the things around you. So in order to analyze this program, I ended up making a survey that I sent to people that went on the trip and also people that didn't go on the trip. So for both of those groups, I made a group of survey questions, there were 13, and they were basically, a, a, one is agree, five is disagree, and then I compared the mean of those two groups. Um, I also did like yes and no and short answer questions for the people that went on the backpacking trip to see what impacted them the most. So here are the questions. Um, I can come back later um, if you all want to see them during the question time. So when I got back my results from the survey, I ended up having, the total experimental group was seven and I had a response rate of 57. So there are only four people that responded. And then in the control group, I got about nine respondents. So which is, with such a small sample size and also a high variability, I wasn't able to use a regular parametric test. I had to go with a non-parametric man with EU test. Um, and due to like the amount of responses, the, U, the significance value was U equals four at alpha 0 0.10, which will make a little bit more sense with the next graph. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but here are the kind of results. So the experimental mean, like the average response, like most agree being one, least agree being five, and the control mean, so that's like the people that didn't go backpacking, and the experimental mean is the people that did go backpacking. Um, highlighted in green is the one that was most significant, which was question, er, oops, which was most significant, which is question 13. Um, and question 13 was orientation changed how I view my role in enacting sustainability or how I choose to take care of the environment. Which I think is, you know, it makes sense there's a difference between people going backpacking and people not going backpacking. Because if you're on campus doing the same thing you would do every other day, you know, your trash goes in the trash can, you're not pooping in holes, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like pretty, it's pretty different. Um, and then the other two questions that were the second most significant were orientation helped me to feel more comfortable in my community and orientation helped me to feel more confident. So those that attended the backpacking trip, uh, probably because of like the, the roles they had in working together and like overcoming obstacles, experienced like a raise in confidence and also a raise in comfortability in their community. This is also the section, or moving on to the section just for the people that attended the backpacking orientation, 75% of respondents noted a positive impact on their first quarter due to relationships formed during the backpacking orientation. 50% reported increased confidence in communal settings, and 50% reported different perspective, a different perspective on the outdoors after going through this orientation. Um, also, like of all of the respondents in totality, 44% responded that getting to know their peers was the most important part of orientation. And of all the people who went backpacking, 100% of the respondents said they would try backpacking again. <laughs> So this is my last slide. Um, just if people were gonna do this again for like future studies, you could get more scientifically sound data with a larger participant group, possibly through doing a longitudinal study. So seeing, you know, before the program, after the program, and maybe even a year later, just to see what kind of viewpoints stuck around, what kind of dissipate over time. And then also like focusing the backpacking curriculum more on environmental responsibility, since that seemed to have the biggest impact in this kind of pilot study. Um, and then my recommendations, if this program was to be grown, which I hope it is, I hope it continues, um, is to like create a leader training program that could benefit current students and upperclassmen at the college, so they can learn to like, you know, lead their peers in other situations. Um, also to standardize the gear we used, we had like I don't know, like four different kind of backpacks, so just like it would be a lot easier for leaders to know like, okay, they all adjust this way, <laughs> and then be done. <laughs> um, and the other thing would be to choose a new location, because actually, like Vesuvius, on the third day, we just had awful problems with bugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> which I know could happen anywhere, but it was particularly bad. Um, so, and yeah, here are my references. So, any questions?
Katie, oh, thank you so much. Um, I think retention is a huge issue in any college. And so have you talked to the Dean of Students here? Has this been, what have you done with this? I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, um, I've talked to people a little bit, um, and I did continue to continue on the program, and they're all in support of that. My actual issue has been finding students to volunteer to lead this. Um, but I do hope that at some point I can have the opportunity to like kind of write out all of my recommendations and other things and forward that along to the student life team. So my first year, we, we did this kind of as an ad hoc group. We went, we did an overnight in the Glen, but then my, we had a preceptoral fellows. We had two upperclassmen and a preceptor who was a faculty member, and they took us to Kentucky, and we went for three or four days. And that was a very important bonding experience, so much like what you're talking about. Um, are there hall advisors, or is there any freshman orientation structure in place? Yeah, so for the regular orientation, there's students every year that I picked up to help with orientation. And then there's also like residential advisors, so like RAs. Um, and I also have the outdoors club group on campus um, that aren't necessarily like in a leadership role, but like will, they have the gear and kind of the know-how to take others. So what would make it more possible? Is it money, time, credit? I think just like fostering an interest. That's another thing is that there are so many students on campus that are from cities and not particularly interested or kind of afraid of the outdoors. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Okay, thanks. I'm told I have to say who I am. <laughs> I'm Rifka Gowertz Little. I'm new to the alumni board. Um, I, so you have a challenge because um, not everyone took this survey. So I'm wondering if you thought about just like not letting anyone off the bus until they took the survey as a <laughs> tactic. <laughs> but also from a qualitative perspective, right? So you did your quantitative research, and I'd love to I'd love to hear your thoughts from a qualitative perspective, what you got from it. And it sounds like p potentially one thing was that incoming students from cities may need to have a different experience. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's not outdoors. It doesn't mean that it's not environmental. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are around that. Yeah. Um the whole thing with the survey, it was actually six months later that I sent out the survey. Um, so there was no, unfortunately, no holding on the bus. <laughs> um, we did talk, though. I talked to all the participants on the last day and was kind of like, you know, how was your time? What do you think? Like, are you glad you did it? Um, and yeah, qualitatively, like I have to say, some people did feel challenged, I think, particularly people, there. we had three people from inner city Chicago who had been to the woods maybe once. Um, and I don't think that backpacking is out of the realm of possibility for people that have, haven't done it before, for sure. Um, one of those very people that I was talking about who had maybe only seen the woods once was like, I'm so glad I did this. Like, I never would have had this opportunity. Um, and it's something totally new that I love. Or I don't know about love, but like, <laughs> really enjoyed. And I think like it really comes down to kind of like the preparation, um, which is something I wish I could have done more with just because I've grown up in rural areas my whole life and I didn't anticipate how alien it might feel for some people to be like in the woods. Um, so like just more, like talking about it more I think and also um, making sure people know what they're in for, which I mean everyone came away fine. <laughs> and. <laughs> Um, but also like having smaller trips I think would be good um, or even just like outings to the Glen and other things like that. Um, yeah. Thank you Katie. We do have 10 minutes left and we want Noah to be able to present so if you have more questions for Katie find her after this or send her an email. Noah are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Give me a second, I gotta kind of log into my thing. And I'm gonna actually uh, unplug this because I got weird emails, so. 
Uh, while we wait, Delaney is going to tell you about her first co-op. Okay, I'm here as entertainment. It's fun. So I am a rising second year, so I just came back from co-op like three weeks ago, and I went to Greece. I was in a, a shared living community with adults with uh, special needs. So basically, I would wake up, I would go eat breakfast with everyone, I would go help get some of the guys dressed, and then we would go and do a workshop. So I was in the jewelry workshop, and I was paired with um, a woman named Nikki, and we would make a whole bunch of these beaded necklaces all day. <laughs> well, not all day, for a few hours. And then we would go back, and I would support during the lunch program. And then, because it was Greece, we had this wonderful thing called the Mezzi Maddy, which, if anyone speaks Greek, I don't know. Um, it's basically a break in the middle of the day. Siesta, Siesta yes in other languages. Um, and then after that, we would have evening activities. So we would have Friday dance parties, which is a lot of fun because it's a lot of Greek music that I didn't understand. Uh, and now Noah's gonna tell you about his stuff. Okay, um, given the time constraint, I'm gonna have to speed through this. And my final project was in the form of a podcast. Uh, it was an oral history project that kind of started from a co-op into an oral history project into a senior project. But Can the alumni access the podcast somewhere, Noah? Um, yeah, I'm still tweaking it a little bit because I was really pressed for time. It was very ambitious to make it a podcast, so maybe I'll send it to you when it's a little more polished. I'm not sure how to get rid of that. Okay, there it goes. Um, an exploration of communal living in Israel. I went to Israel to explore different forms of communal living, so I hope it's aptly named. Um, a little background. First of all, when I tell people I want to study communal living in Israel, um, I get a variety of reactions. I get why communal living from the, uh, you know, the most, you know, the most polite of my friend's parents. Oh, uh, what's the big deal about communal living? Don't you mean a cult? Because there's a different way. You see your communal living, a lot of, in America, they had a lot of cults. Those get a lot of media play. Um, that sounds kind of weird to me. You sound kind of weird to me. Um, which is nothing new for me. Um, you can ask my friends. It all started with a place called Chava Adam which is kind of a word play. It means Adam and Eve, but Chava is Hebrew for Eve, and they put Eve before, because they're kind of trying to shake it up. It's about damn time, right? Um, and also, Adam and Eve, if you didn't know, biblically means farm and man. Chava means farm, and Adam, like Adam, means man. It's a union of farm and man. Another interpretation of the Genesis story. Um, I went here in 2014 before I came to Antioch, and I was very moved by it. It was my first experience at a place uh, that was, could be called intentional communities. Uh, it's uh, the website ic.org, so it did like copyright earn that uh, term. An intentional community was actually, the term I believe was created by, Ar I know it was created in Yellow Springs, and it was created by Arthur Morgan, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So everything comes full circle. And like, you bet I met some Antiochians in Israel that I did not expect to meet. Um, and here's just kind of a picture of the community garden. Um, I'm as sick of that word as you are. Um, but fast forward to February 12th, 2018. Um, I was a floundering literature major, knew I had to do something different. I couldn't deal with kind of writing deadlines. So I tried to own my education. I thought, wouldn't it be such a good job to be a Bachelor of Science? Wouldn't that sound so cool? I'm thinking about the future. I'm getting questions from adults. And um, let's self-design, because I found I could get away from a lot of different requirements that were otherwise mandated for me. And, my, and the major name was TBA, so my advisor said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm sure it will put itself together. Um, four months later, I'm like, you know what, I don't want to do that. Well, I want to take Antioch seriously, I want to own my education. So I'm like, let's actually study something that I care about. And I, communal studies is a legit thing. There's a communal studies association. I know UC Santa Cruz has a major program in that. So it had some legitimacy. 
slid me back to a BA. I'll pay for that in the future. Um, but it still allowed me to self-design my own major. And it was what I wanted to do. I remember it had emotional sig significance. And, and those things stick and have weight. And oh, God, I'm a sappy guy. So it, you know, so why did I change it? You know, it must be love. And I'm also a little sometimes heady sometimes. So there's Max Scheller, who was a German philosopher. And his idea was to know something. The prerequisite was to love it. And almost vice versa, like a positive feedback loop. Things become open to you when you love it. Um, especially this part. The loving philosophical being is not motivated to know by a sense of lack, as is the case with Eris, but is rather motivated by the abundance and surf fate of the meaning of the world. So when I graduated high school, I was very lost, and I feel like I lost a lot of community. But that didn't push me to study community. What pushed me to do it is not from the lack, but when I found it at a place like Havave Adam. And I always remember that. It, those kind of experiences have staying power. Um, so the starting point for my kind of mode of inquiry was, OK, I want to start a communal living. I want to study that. What does that mean? First, you have to define the terms. Extremely difficult. The current authority on denotations in the English language, Marion Webster says, a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together within a larger society. Now, what's more hollow than that? You know what I mean? That doesn't feel like community to me. Um, and it is a feeling thing. And as I looked for more definitions, I thought I would start with a local hero, <laughs> Arthur Morgan, the man, the myth, um, the legend, except for those who were alive when he was. And he was a president of Antioch College. He was founder of the CELO community, um, which may be mentioned by Katie near the Arthur Morgan School. Community Services, uh, a company that hired me now, and they're called Community Solutions now and started the Fellowship of Intentional Communities, where I believe the name was coined. And he's just an ambassador for small town living. And he told me that a community is an association of individuals and families that, out of inclination, habit, custom, and mutual interest, which is an intentional part, act in concert as a unit in meeting their common needs. Um, I like that one better than Marion Webster, but I still never heard anyone else say that when I said, what is community? Um, and that's the thing about some esoteric words, especially ones that are important to us, is that um, we all have a definition for it, but the issue is that we all have a different one. Um, so how do we bridge that? Um, four provocative words. Porn, violence, art, community. Why am I making you read these words? Um, <laughs> It's because um, they, they all share, hang with me here, they all share that same thing, that esoteric, unshared definition, that type of word where you don't know what you mean, you don't know what it means, but you know it when you see it, or you know it when you experience it. And we think, we think about these things, but we actually kind of talk around them. So I really wanted to go in depth into the last one community. And what became a negative was, wow, everyone's on a different page. No one knows um, you know, how to bridge this gap became, I thought, a strength. It became a starting point, a launch off point. Let's roll with it. You know, ambiguity can be that very essence of it, the ambiguity of it, can be the subject, can be the, the kind of exact inquiry what I'm looking for. So I became interested in all these different varying narratives, because they were narratives, they weren't denotations. Um, I wondered where they intersected and where they diverged, um, how they were communicated, you know, what is their, what is their mode? Was it, if I sit, tell someone, tell me about your community, they tell me um, a story hanging out with their friends spontaneously? Did they tell me who makes decisions? Do they talk about all their frustrations and vent in a pulse session? I know you've done before. And then how does the individual's place, what is their role, hierarchical or not, how does that affect their telling of the story? And it's also very narrative-based, which is why I chose, for many reasons, oral history. I wanted to maintain it in people's voice and kind of keep that integrity of a narrative, rather than standardizing it in Times New Revan font, like I'm doing now. Um, so why Israel? They have something called the kibbutz system, which is a collectivist agricultural community usually around 
100 to 500 people, um, varying in form. I can go like 30 minutes on this, but just know it's a type of kind of agricultural um, communal living system that's very big in Israel and started before the creation of the state of Israel and has changed in form and diverged to a lot of different forms. Transportation, they have public transportation to get anywhere. Got a lot of money from various grants, some Israel specific, some oral history specific. Um, I had connections there because I've been there before and I have a distant, distant cousin who speaks great English and was willing to host me. Um, I do speak a little Hebrew, so it was an opportunity to work on that. And a sense of adventure, I wanted to go really far away from Antioch. Um, there actually is a lot of scholarship on the kibbutz system, so I'm wondering what my um, capstone professor was also wondering, like, is there room, it was kind of rhetorical when he said, but is there room for one more, what, what can I add to the scholarship? Um, well, one, just the form of oral history, that hasn't been that common um, necessarily in, in kind of kibbutz scholarship. And I was less interested in what happened. There was a lot of buzz about it in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, but more interested in what's happening now and what it became. Um, there's changing conditions which have um, surrounding the kibbutz. Kibbutzim is plural for kibbutz. Um, and I wanted to see how the changing socio-political economic conditions affected um, the country in which the kibbutz lived and how that affected the inner workings of the kibbutz which theoretically is pretty off-grid, at least materially, but they're very well connected to the state. Um, and then what new forms of communal living have taken place and how did existing ones adapt? Um, quick timeline, summer 2018 took a methodology course on oral history with Nina Ellis and Charles Fairbanks. The second is the professor, the first is the head of WISO. I did a training at Kenyon, um, Fall was my co-op where I did interviews in Israel. Winter, I collected secondary source material and did research. Uh, and spring, my last quarter was to really quickly craft a story and make a good enough podcast. Um, there are some historical questions I went off of. How did we get to this point? There's a lot of people who I talked to in the kibbutz who were older and they said, oh, this, the kibbutz is dead. You know, back in my day, all the kids were raised together. Um, you know, we weren't as privatized. Now a lot of the brands have sold out. Um, some things people are happy to give up. Some, some things people weren't. There was more of an egalitarian economy. You know, there's an idea of like, there's like maybe four pure kibbutz seen left. And that refers to the fact that um, how they allot money, that everyone would get the same kind of housing, everyone would get the same stipend. And a lot of them are privatized since. And David Leach, who's a writer, about kibbutzim, I think he's Canadian, wrote that the kibbutz is utopias of reconstruction that didn't remain on the page like Plato's Republic, which for doing an oral history project is great. I don't have to be stuck reading a book about it. I can go to one of these utopias of reconstruction. And so I went, in 2018, I went back to Chavav Adam Farm, which I went to in 2014 to conduct interviews. Uh, this is where I stayed. It could be the exact same bed I stayed at um, <laughs> four years ago. It was the same, on the same frame. Um, and their living is done, you can see it from the inside, but in a geodesic dome. That's kind of the honeycomb frame inside. Um, they call themselves an eco-educational farm. They do ecological education. Um, residential programs for people that live there, like me in 2014. And, um, non-residential programs for community members and school groups. Um, they're also, as the director told me, you know, we try to be a hell of a place to picnic. And it really is, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful venue space. And so I got to work and I made, this was somehow the most viable place for me to give interviews. <laughs> um, it was a corner of the farm and I set up a couple chairs and had a table. Um, that I made with some, you know, concrete bricks and a piece of plywood. And you know, like, one of my biggest inspirations say, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, well, you might find that you get what you need. So I tried to channel that in my oral history project, which didn't get the pass from my advisor, but it's like, hey, you know, you can do what you can do. Um, and she also rolled with it. 
Um, this you can't read. It's mer maybe you can. Merkaz Simchi Marpe, and this was the. I think I don't have a good picture of the inside, but it's the medicinal herbs. Um, kind of, it is a shop sometimes. It's an educational place. Other times, it's a place to hang out for personal use. But they had all these different tinctures, salves. It was a source of income. It was, um, you know, an educational opportunity. And it was also a way to take the production of medicine into your own hands and to get off the grid in that way. And this is a bunch of wheelbarrows and a bunch of drip irrigation. Israel is like invented drip irrigation because if you've got to grow food in the desert, you've got to be really efficient with water. And this is also a testament to, they practice a type of agriculture called permaculture, which is very into, um, it kind of means like, it's a design for human systems, um, being a food-centric one. So one aspect of permaculture, and someone said this name, William, I forgot his last name, but it was like, you replace petroleum with people. That's a part of sustainable agriculture, sustainable agriculture in general. The catch is that petroleum, uh, at least when you're you know, using it to power a tractor, is pretty drama-free. Uh, when you place it with people working together, uh, we're petty. Um, so, uh, you know, there's complications there, and that's when a good kind of communal infrastructure comes into play. Um, they also made just the most beautiful potpourri I've ever experienced. Uh, it, it's, it smelled good if you were there. Um, but they didn't undervalue aesthetic. I mean, they lived there. They were invested in living in a place um, that was beautiful, not just working there and leaving at 5 p.m. Um, so those are some pictorial lessons, but I'm almost done. I'm really close. I'm sorry. But some lessons I learned. I did go to other places, by the way, but I'm just going to show you one as a case study. This, this man is Australian, and he moved to Israel three-ish years ago. His name's Dobie Ben. He's the agricultural coordinator. When my advisor heard this interview, uh, she said, this is the best and worst interview that I had because... I became a little too close to the subjects, and we were laughing a lot and having a good time. And he doesn't underestimate the power of like good vibes in a community. Um, and I asked them if there's any part of himself he couldn't bring. I like to ask people like the negative stuff too, like what can you not bring uh, to this community of yourself? Do you think you can't be that goofy side that you are? You think you can't be the critical one, and people are very judgmental. And he was there for three years, so he had good things to say. He said, if, if I felt repressed, if I felt I couldn't bring a lot of myself to this place, I couldn't stay here. He couldn't be here for the amount of time he was. Um, so one thing I took from that, and I saw, based on what others say, is kind of radical acceptance. Um, judging the things that people say versus the core of their being. Because um, a lot of sides you don't see from people. So that's one thing, in, also in terms of college retention, you know, I'm thinking about... Um, if you can't bring a lot to yourself, it's just not comfortable to live in a place you can't bring a lot of yourself to. It does, that, that won't last, that's not sustainable. Another thing I learned was on the subject of conflict resolution. Um, the man on the right is named Yorai Ravon, and he was kind of a gap year. Um, there's mandatory military service in Israel, but you can do a gap year where you kind of do national service beforehand. And Yorai was one of 15 people who did this um, year-long kind of residential program is there. And I got a shot of him arguing, which I confirmed it's okay to do, but you can kind of see it's all about the framing. Um, if you, and he's told me if you don't have structures or systems set up to release pressure, you know, where is it going to go? Um, what kind of negative effect does that have? And they have a couple things. They have something called a listening circle where they all meet together once a week and could be venting um, could be compliments and all positivity. Um, but it was an outlet for you to say what you want unfiltered. And it's called listening circle, not talking circle, because it's an emphasis on listening. 14 of the 15 people in the room at any given time were listening. So they choose to name it that. Um, there's also a concept called, uh, that they tried, called, um, which is done in other cultures, too, called digging a hole. And if you have a really bad argument with someone, you go out with them in a field and you face them and you dig a hole with them in between you and you yell all your negativity into the hole. Um, and they hear it, you know. It's not so point source. And then you bury the hole with your arguments that live there. Um, also, I learned, and this is 
a couple sides of this, but from Chaya Liv, who was, Eco Israel is the five month residential program that's open to international people where they learn about medicinal herbs, um, sustainable building practices, and sustainable agriculture, uh, specifically permaculture. And she was the coordinator of this program. And she said, the money trail is a fine line to walk. Don't forget about it, but don't meditate on it. And just to bring you back to Arthur Morgan, I thought of pragmatic idealism, which is his, his big thing, his money maker. And because um, she needed to be sustainability, you had to have money. She, she kind of ran the more expensive of the programs, but she also knew that you can live and die with that. Or if you survive, um, you know, there's, like, who are you going to be even if you're, if you're so focused on the money, is that even, you kind of get to a place where you kind of forget what your goal was in the first place. So she tried to balance being um, financially, you know, sustainable with maintaining your ideology. And this is Ohad Yaron, and he called himself the director in chief, because um, he liked to president in chief thing. And he was the, he did a lot of things, but, uh, um, <laughs> Now in his role there, he was director when I was talking to him. And when I asked him, you know, just kind of, a, I think a general leading question, like what's so special about this place? Or what do you credit your success? How do you credit your success? He said, you know, don't forget who this is for. You know why we lasted so long, why people love it here. It's we put them first. So it's a people first approach. And he told me to not live and die with your ideology. Um, if that has to bend, um, and it should bend with people's input. And there's that you know, tension between maintaining your kind of constitutional tenets and having flexibility to change. Um, Thank you, that's, Noah. That's yeah. Thank you. Um, we, I know that all of you are in a hurry to get to the Leon Higginbotham lecture in the South Gym, so we, can't, we don't have time for questions, but you feel free to walk up to Noah now or later in the weekend. And thank you so much for coming to support our wonderful students. <laughs>